Welcome to our Way Forward Leader lunch break on this magnificent early fall afternoon. We've read so much in the news and heard so much lately about the plight of those in Afghanistan and those who were able to escape. And we're grateful that Patrick Hearns is with us today to enlighten us as to what is our response. And Patrick is described as an organizational leader, a program and business developer, an educator, but most importantly, a change agent. He has devoted his entire life to serving refugees and currently serves Cleveland and our refugee community as the executive director of Refugee Response. He came to Cleveland five years ago, specifically he chose the Ohio City neighborhood following 14 years of work in Southeast Asia. There he taught youth who were political exiles from Myanmar. He lived in a refugee camp on the Thai-Myanmar border where he co-founded a school for young adults he opened a Thai foundation for stateless youth, and he worked as the director for world education in Thailand and Myanmar. In 2014, his work was recognized by His Holiness the Dalai Lama with the Unsung Heroes of Compassion Award. At the Leadership Center, we often speak about compassionate leadership and leading with compassion, and Patrick Kearns embodies both of these. His service is evident in the smiles of the refugees, more than 2,500 who now call Cleveland home, and most tangibly in the magnificence of the Ohio City Urban Farm. Patrick, thank you for joining us. Thank you, thank you for that really, that, that gracious introduction, and I'm happy to be here uh, with you all today. I see some uh, familiar names and faces, so great to uh, great to see you all. Thanks for, thanks for uh, joining. Uh, I'm gonna take what is a, very complicated, uh, highly volatile and changing, rapidly evolving situation and try to present a, an image of that in the next 10 minutes. That's gonna make some sense. Uh, and then so we can leave some time for questions. So I'm gonna start with two anecdotes uh, that have happened in the past month that I think kind of highlight a little bit of what this situation means. And you know what I think is always important to understand is that when we talk about these very you know, macro foreign policies, uh, it's also important when we look at those macro foreign policies have very direct and immediate micro impacts on our lives, our work here, uh, and with the clients that we are very fortunate to serve. Um, so, you know, as you all can remember, which seems like, you know, either nine years ago or two days ago on August 15th, uh, Kabul fell. Um, and, you know, that had been, you know, about five days of, you know, we saw these provincial capitals collapse. We saw populations start to really retreat into the center. Uh, then on 15th, Kabul fell. That meant the armed forces, the U.S. Embassy uh, stationed in and around the, uh, the airport in Kabul, right? So that became the central focus of all the news stories that came out. So on August 15th, we rapidly became aware after doing some outreach to our clients that four families uh, that were Afghan families either citizens or green card holders were in country. They had gone back uh, on an extended stay to visit families, um, to go to weddings. Um, so we quickly mobilized with uh, State Department DOD, Sherrod Brown's office to see what was possible, right? This is an unprecedented situation really since the fall of Saigon. Um, so rapidly responded in that context. I was I'm very happy to say three families were able to get their travel authorization documents and get out, get to the airport, get out immediately. Uh, one family was a mom and her three daughters who had traveled for a wedding. Uh, dad was here working. Um, they were terrified to, to try to leave the, the house. So the 15th went by, the 16th went by, um, and then I think it was around the 22nd when the first bombing happened that was outside the airport. Um, and then it became very apparent that August 31st was going to be the cutoff deadline for the last planes to go out. So on the 28th, uh, they made their way to the Kabul airport. They got 300 meters away from the gate. They were held at gunpoint with the crowd by the Taliban who said the U.S. Armed Forces had to come out and claim them. Um, you know, we were in contact with a lot of different, you know, people that we would normally, our circles do not cross with, with Dan Crenshaw's office, with Senator Tom Cotton's office, with Sherrod Brown's office, with NATO, with DOD. Um, and for, you know, we had the family on the phone. They had been on the street for 28 hours at that point. Uh, the gates opened, rioting happened, shots were fired, the gates were quickly sealed, uh, nobody was allowed to arrive, and they actually, the last flights that went out for that batch was on uh, August 29th, so they're still in the country. Um, 
And I contrast that with um, this week, we were having our annual benefit and one of our key speakers is a young woman from Afghanistan who graduated from our teen response program, who is in her second year at CSU on a full academic scholarship. She is speaking uh, at the benefit in front of a crowd of 500 people. And if you co contrast the difference in her life right now to those other teenagers, those young women who are in our program, what their life looks like now in Afghanistan, you couldn't come up with a starker contrast. So that was, you know, what we saw immediately happen with, and that was with green card holders and with US citizens. Secondly, uh, this was about three weeks ago, we had a family show up at our office, um, unannounced uh, with, you know, kind of just you know, kind of rock up, um, got a call, went over and met, meet them. And it was a family that had just flown in from Kabul. They arrived in Philadelphia, uh, walked out of the airport with no documentation whatsoever, ended up on a bus because they had a family connection here in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, they had no documentation other than a paper wristband that had a barcode on it. Um, and it was like, well, what happens next? What's, what's the game plan? Um, so we're very fortunate to work very closely with Catholic Charities, which is one of the three resettlement agencies in the area. So quickly we worked with them, we talked with state and DOD and the information we got was that they had to go back immediately to the Philadelphia airport and find a bus to get to a, to get to a military camp where they'd be processed. So they walked out of the airport, they missed the bus and they ended up in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, you know, we drove them back to Philadelphia <laughs> on a very long day, two and a half hours of, uh, I'll say, politely negotiating with uh, TSA, with state, with the military, they finally let them back in the airport. Uh, but it's a, it was a shocking thing. We, we, you know, we showed up where we were told to at the gate of the airport. Uh, we were met by uh, you know, uh, gentlemen in full tactical gear with assault rifles uh, who told us to leave immediately. Uh, and it became a very complicated negotiating process from that point. But they did get into the airport and they texted us later that they got to the base. So they will get out of there with their um, uh, security uh, uh, ID cards with work authorization. Uh, and hopefully they'll be in Cleveland here in a couple of weeks from now. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, but that kind of highlights this level of uncertainty and complication of the environment that we are now in because of how precipitously the country collapsed. I think there was a news report that was out last night where you know, they had different generals speak and nobody anticipated the collapse would happen this quickly. I think you know, uh, there were talks around maybe fall, maybe winter, or maybe you know, maybe the, the government would be able to hang in there. Well, uh, as we know now, that didn't work. Uh, and even those worst case scenarios, the, the real situation was, was much, much worse than that. Um, so you know, in those two stories, you know, I wanted to highlight you know, just what the challenges are right now that this is an unprecedented situation that we're facing. Um, and we are expecting in starting, well, starting right now and then over the next two months, uh, hundreds of new arrivals. So there are close to 90,000 folks who are stationed on US military bases or in Qatar or in Germany at the airport. The goal is in two months for them all to move out of those bases. So that's 8,000 individuals a week going into different cities. Well, why Cleveland? Cleveland has historically been for the past 12 years, one of the 19 cities in America that accept what we call the SIVs, Special Immigrant Visa Populations. Those are specifically reserved for Afghan and Iraqis who provided material support or uh, infrastructure or resource support uh, working alongside of our US uh, armed forces or our State Department. So that means we're expecting uh, quite a few, uh, you know, several hundred new arrivals coming in the next couple of months that are arriving um, it, very, very soon. Now, we are set up that, you know, Cleveland is very fortunate to have three national agencies that work on the resettlement end. So that is Catholic Charities, uh, USCRI, and HIAS. Uh, HIAS goes by their affiliate, Us Together, in Cleveland, uh, in, in Ohio. Um, so they are set up. What we know right now is that there's a 30 day and what we're calling the skinny support package uh, that is gonna be provided by the federal government. That's gonna provide about 30 days of very modest support for newly arriving families. Um, that is different than the traditional refugee resettlement package that is allocated through the federal government to welcome new folks. So 
what we're seeing is in the next you know couple weeks a high rate of new arrival in a short window of time this is coming directly on the heels of four years of really very very few new arrivals coming into the country through the refugee resettlement program which has meant then the agencies that typically provide that support service at the front end they've really scaled back and scaled down they've lost long-term staff they've reduced staff they've reduced offices in different areas so we're at a point in the last 30 years where the resettlement industry is the lightest uh that it's that it has been while we are anticipating the highest number of new arrivals we've seen in decades i mean not even close to the last 20 years of arrivals so cleveland is anticipating between a minimum of 300 i think the real number is 600 to 750 new arrivals that is on top of the already allocated 1200 to 1500 new arrivals through the refugee resettlement program coming from countries as disparate as Congo, Somalia, Sudan, uh, Iraq, uh, and, and Nepal. So that means we're going to have a big influx of new arrivals that we have to get ready for. Um, what, are we, what do we know? What, 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 are we, what are we looking at next? I mean, we know that housing is going to be one of the key challenges, right? So I don't think it's any secret, the housing market here in Cleveland is very different than it was even five years ago. Uh, it's very different than it was 10 years ago. And it means a lot of the areas where folks had, you know, when immigrants and refugee populations had traditionally come in, they're priced out, right? There's a lot of Afghan families that live in Lakewood because 10 years ago, you could get an apartment, you could buy a house in Lakewood uh, to start. Right now, even the rents in Lakewood are priced out. So we, you know, we haven't had anybody move into Lakewood as a new arrival in the last couple of years. And that's an example of how this market's changed and how we have to respond to this. So that housing is going to be a critical first issue, which means there's probably going to have to look at immediate transitional housing and then go into long-term planning. Um, one thing that's very different about this um, that I think is really important for all of us and as a city to understand, that's very common through this work that we work with populations that have experienced uh, intense amounts of trauma in their lives. Um, you know, and we can look at different cases and, you know, different areas and different conflicts across the globe. What's slightly different here is that you have a arriving population um, that has probably a multi-generational impact of trauma and violence and conflict just due to the, you know, due to the, you know, provincial wars that have happened in Afghanistan, the U.S. military presence, and you also have a very recent trauma within the past few weeks. Um, that is something that we don't typically see. So typically how the process will work is, you know, folks will go into a different country. They'll spend a considerable amount of time in a refugee camp uh, where they have some basic processing, where they have access to social support services, uh, and then they resettle. This is a case where people are literally coming from those pictures that we all saw at the airport of people, you know, young men and young women falling off the airplanes, uh, bombs going off on the streets, uh, people being attacked throughout the roads, getting on an airplane, showing up, being processed in a U.S. military base in a camp that in a tent that is outside and then moving into Cleveland. Right. So that is a different dynamic than we've typically seen in the past, which means that this is going to be a much fresher source of trauma that we're going to be working with with these families. We also know that because of how our system works and how there's you know little support is that these families have to start working right away. Otherwise, there's very little ability for them to be to get support and support themselves. The package right now does not qualify adults for any social services, Medicaid, Medicare, any benefits programs. Period. Right. Some of the children do, of course, because that's you know that's a that's a federal law, but the adults do not. So that is a real crunch point. There is a bill right now that we are, you know, we're following the news with the continuing resolution. They've attached an Afghan support program onto the continuing resolution that would give more robust support to these newly arriving folks, right? Uh, but as we know, what is the future of that bill? Uh, completely uncertain. Initially, that bill had been parked in the infrastructure package, 
and they made a decision to park it with the continu continuing resolution in the idea that that was more of a surefire uh, guarantee. Well, I mean, right now we know nothing is a surefire guarantee with how our government works. Um, and we very uncertain what the future of that will look like and if there's gonna be the support package. Um, so we are kind of preparing for the, uh, I don't wanna say worst case scenario, but a pretty challenging environment, uh, really a very uh, modest amount of support uh, provided. And so what are we doing with that? Um, you know, one thing I'm very proud of and proud of the city of, the city of Cleveland is that we have a, uh, a coordination body called the Refugee Services Collaborative that many different agencies that come together. So it's those national agencies, it's Building Hope in the City, it's Refugee Response, it's Neighborhood Family Practice, the school districts and some healthcare providers um, that work together. And I think that's how we're, you know, imagining this future to go is a very coordinated mechanism where we each can take a part that our agencies can play in. Um, priorities immediately, and I'll finish up on this, are housing, employment, mental health, and access to education and healthcare, right? Those are gonna be the 90 day priorities that we're gonna try to roll out to meet this, uh, this ever evolving and changing and highly uncertain, uh, you know, uh, situation that, that we are in right now. Um, so I, I hope I didn't speak too fast there, but I want to, there's a lot of information to get in. So I, I hope that's, I hope that was modestly clear. Um, and that I'm talking any kind of sense uh, and would be happy to address any, any questions that, that you all might have. Well, Patrick, thank you so much. I think you did a great job covering a lot of ground in a short amount of time. And we have had some questions come in so we can discuss a little further. The first question, kind of going to that uh, support package, why is this particular package so skinny compared to the standard support? Oh, because it wasn't planned for, right? So the typical package comes with the refugee resettlement program. Refugee resettlement program, remember, it, 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 it gets passed by the administration. The administration sets the ceiling for how many new arrivals are going to come in and that our budget process matches with that ceiling number, right? So that means when folks are coming in, uh, it's allocated per head what support they're going to have. And typically, you know, as the refugee resettlement program works, it is not a quick moving process, right? Typically, you know, on average globally, folks are in refugee camps for 15 years. The processing, the paperwork processing alone takes three years for people to, to, to get here. Um, so there's a lot of heads up, there's a lot of planning, there's a lot of, you know, budget structuring that can be passed. That's already provided for. This was, you know, as we mentioned at the top, nobody saw this coming. I mean, well, that's not true. That, that's not true. A lot of people saw this coming. A lot of people saw that the country was going to collapse, but the decision makers did not see that it would happen this precipitously. Um, and so there was no support structure. So they have really just carved out this basic support structure of what funding is available, and they've allocated it per head across those, you know, estimated 90,000. I mean, I think it's probably closer to 80,000 folks that we're talking about, and they've allocated it per head that way. Now that doesn't include anything after 30 days. It doesn't include long-term housing. It doesn't include employment support. It doesn't include uh, English language support uh, or any of the cultural, uh, it does include some basic cultural orientation programs, um, but there's a lot that's typically there. And, you know, I'll say this, you know, the typical refugee resettlement program doesn't have a lot of bells and whistles to it already. It's pretty lean. Um, and so if you can imagine, a leaner version of you know what's already provided. That's that's the situation we're looking at. Unless unless this bill does pass, which would I think be be a, be a good step forward. So, can you share a bit more about the range of services that your organization provides? And then thinking about how quickly this has come up, how have you been able to work with those services to meet the needs as quickly as they've uh, arrived in our community? Sure. So, uh, you know, we, we have eight different programs we run right now that go from, you know, childhood all the way into uh, with adults, uh, with moms, um, and then, you know, the Ohio City Farm we run as a as social enterprise at the same time. A lot of our focus is on the public school system, so we work very closely with CMSD. We have a program, uh, the state-sponsored program with them to do parent orientation school enrollment. Uh, we have one of our flagship programs is our teen response program that has a um, been running into its fourth year uh, that works with refugee kids in high school, getting them out of high school and into uh, post-secondary, uh, really just 
great track record there uh, for that program. And we're hoping to, to broaden that and then working with adults. Now, I'll say this, we learned a lot from COVID, right? So COVID, I think, taught us all in this industry a lesson of pivoting, right? Saying, all right, well, that was the plan we have on paper. Well, forget that, right? Uh, we have to adjust. Now, uh, you know, I think we all learned a lot institutionally about, you know, how do we how do we look at the resources that we have right now, right? How do we know what resources that we need to immediately bring in? Uh, how do we shift that? And how do we, you know, keep the continuum of services while understanding a changing environmental context? Um, a little bit differently with Afghanistan, obviously we're not closing our other programs, we are bolstering our programs and we're adding on additional support and staffing right now. But that mind frame is still there from like, the COVID mind frame is still there, right? Like let's be ready for anything at any time and let's uh, let's work, let's figure out how to get it done. Um, so, you know, I think we're, we've been able to and we to quickly mobilize, but also it's about this, you know, the partnerships we have with, you know, really close working relationships with agencies like Catholic Charities, like USCRI, and like Building Hope in the City. Um, and, you know, nobody can do this work alone. Uh, it's just, you know, it's really, really complicated. Um, and it takes that, it takes teamwork, it takes coordination, and it takes, um, you know, different agencies figuring out what, how they can provide, but all kind of row in the same direction. I hope that answered the question there, Rachel. So you mentioned partnering with the school district and the Thomas Jefferson International Newcomers Academy is often where refugees begin their uh, school journey. And how ready are they for the influx of refugees and what additional support uh, are you providing and might we be able to provide to help them in that? So, yeah, so, I mean, we've been kind of gearing up for what was going to be a busy year anyway. Um, and, you know, and I'll say this, you know, with Thomas Jefferson, the idea is that kids go there for two years and they then they, you know, they go into a different school once they get past the basic language requirements, which I think is a is an, is an appropriate mechanism um, so that they can kind of mainstream and they can get into other classes, get into other schools and, and graduate in the same in the same capacity. Slightly different when teenagers are arriving um, and need to get caught up at the end. Um, so, you know, we had been working with them on these enrollment programs uh, that provide support to parents, that provide support to kids, and really boosting the after-school programs, right? So the, you know, the um, uh, soccer programs after school, the arts programs after school, in a way to build these uh, landing pads where new kids in the city can have quick touch points. They don't need to go through a really rigorous enrollment process or an annual schedule, but they can join and then they can understand what other options are there. Now, uh, what's going to happen with you know, the new kids coming in from Afghanistan. I mean, we can anticipate it. So the numbers we're seeing right now is kind of interesting. Uh, Afghanistan, folks coming in from Afghanistan uh, typically have rather large families. Uh, these are seven, eight families, uh, seven and eight person families. And we can anticipate that, you know, at least 25% are going to be teenagers uh, and at least 25% are going to be, you know, 13 and under. That's going to be a big challenge. Um, one nice thing is that, you know, culturally it's the same group. There's two or three different main languages that have to be covered, but that, you know, we're not talking about 20 languages, um, but it's gonna be a challenge uh, and it's gonna put administrative challenges on there. Now, the other thing is because the housing stock is so critically low, we're not sure that all these families are actually gonna end up in the city of Cleveland or go to Cleveland public schools. So there's a good chance they're gonna be in other areas outside of the city going to other school districts, which presents a different challenge. So how are you working with these school districts that are not typically accustomed to dealing with large numbers of newcomers? How can we prep the school district? How can we prep the schools? And how can we provide them some support? Um, you know, the, uh, there is a federal policy that requires school districts to have language support in the, in the home language of their families. And it is one of these beautiful things we call the unfunded mandate. It means they have to do it, but there's no government funding behind it. So what does that mean? Is that school districts that are really stretched tight, um, that's not where they can put their resources if, they, if there is not a lot of advocacy, support, and a, in a, in a, in a number of those populations to work with. So that's something we know is going to be an issue as soon as the, you know, kids start going into these, uh, these you know, school districts that are kind of outside of the Cleveland area. So, and as we look at our region, how prepared are we to accept the refugees who are coming here and how can Clevelanders help and support their settlement and also your work in helping them to become settled? 
Sure. So, I mean, I think I think Cleveland's, you know, it's going to be a challenge, but we're better prepared than a lot of places. I will say that, and I feel pretty good about that. Um, we have a lot of agencies here that work together. Um, there's a lot of strong partnership. There's a lot of community support. Um, there's a lot of very supportive foundations uh, and individuals that make this work possible uh, outside of the federal uh, funding. And we are also very fortunate that there is a large number of positions open. So employment is not a barrier right now for a lot of these families. And these are you know, employment that's not at the $10, $11 an hour, which becomes kind of a deal breaker when you have to sit on a bus for three hours. I mean, these you know, entry level positions we're looking at now are 17, 18, up to $22 an hour, which you know, that's a good option for a family that's new arriving to get into that uh, into that pipeline. Now, the housing is the critical challenge there. There is not the housing uh, to accommodate this number, this number of folks. Um, there's a lot of talk about long-term solutions, which need to happen, uh, but how do you deal with the short-term situation? How do you deal with like, you know, October uh, 21st, when you have uh, 80 families that have just showed up? Uh, you know, that's, that's, gonna be, that's gonna be the challenge. Um, I think strategically, we're all looking at, as far as the sector is concerned, you know, hoping to get people in, you know, if they have direct families here, that's great. And a lot of these folks do have direct family members here that they can provide that support. Secondarily is into existing housing that is possible. And then tertiarily is into that uh, transitional housing. Until then, we can take a look at more permanent housing that's connected to where their um, employment base is. And for those who do settle here, do most stay in Cleveland? Do they end up moving to other communities once they kind of get their their feet underneath them? Uh, Cleveland's actually a magnet for people coming from other cities. So every year we anticipate, what we've seen, uh, we did a study on this last year um, with the Refugee Services Collaborative, is that each year 16% of newly arriving folks are what we call secondary migrants. So they're coming into Cleveland from other cities. Um, they're coming in for, you know, the jobs, you know, typically they had been coming in for the housing availabilities. Um, but they're also coming in because there's anchor points here, right? There's strong community support here. There's large Afghan, Somali, uh, Nepali, uh, Congolese populations. So they're looking for those opportunities here. And it is still, you know, if comparatively a much more affordable place um, if you have a large family. And Ohio is actually, you know, as states go, uh, not bad for, you know, uh, benefit public benefits for children um it's 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 not bad it's it's a lot better than kentucky is um and no shade there i'm from kentucky but uh it's not <laughs> that's not where you want to move to immediately if you have eight kids and you you know don't speak english yet probably maybe not the best first landing landing spot um but you know ohio is a bit more receptive that way with these these social support services and we i mean we also have the health agencies here like like Metro Health that are able to do so much in the community. Um, and I think that's another one of these strategic advantages. Well, Patrick, we have time for one more question. And as you look ahead, what is your vision for refugee response in our community here in Cleveland? Uh, so, I mean, our, our vision is the same. It's that we build transformative programming and we continue to build transformative programming. What I mean by that is, programming that is not transactional. Uh, we are not, you know, yes, during the pandemic, we did food distribution, we did cash assistance uh, to get people through a hurdle, but that's not the kind of programming that we that we what we do. That's not who we are. We, you know, our programming is designed to be transformational in nature, meaning that people coming in, they have certain barriers and challenges to accessing where they hope to be and what their, you know, what their innate talents and what their dreams are. Uh, and it's our, responsibility to tear down some of those barriers and build pathways for them to get to those opportunities. Um, that is our goal. So whether it's success in early childhood, if it's success in employment and moving up into a, you know, a higher paid job bracket, getting into a skilled career, or if it's success in getting out of a high school on time and then getting into university, like those are the types of things that we look at and that's what we continue to hope for. We, we have no interest in becoming a national agency. Um, they're, the national agencies are already here and they do what they do. And, you know, we, we love working with them. We're only interested in providing more qualitative support in the city of Cleveland and expanding our depth into how we are able to help families that, that are in our orbit. Well, Patrick, we thank you so much for sharing your insights and your work today. And thank you for all you do and your organization does for those who are coming here to Cleveland. 
Thanks. Well, thanks for having this. It's, it's, you know, I've done a lot of these talks recently, so it's, uh, you know, I know it's a, it's an important topic. Um, so I, I hope that was a little, a little clearer. So thank you all for being here and listening to me uh, rant on this topic. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Patrick, not at all a rant. Thank you for all of the great information that you shared. And we could just feel your passion exuding from the screen. And I hope that you'll stay in touch with us because you have a lot of folks on this call who would love to be able to support your work and they can send it out to their networks because the, the work you do is huge and critically important and it's it should be shared by the community at large. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.